Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to today's Medical Center Hour, a program called The Good News About Giving Bad News. I'm Marcia Day Childress from the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities. We bring you these programs every week, and we're delighted to see all of you here today. Um, our program today um, is part of a partnership that we have with the UVA Department of Chaplaincy Services and Pastoral Education. Uh, we very much welcome this partnership, and to begin the hour, I'd like to welcome Chaplain Dick Haynes, who's chair of the department. Uh, the chaplaincy program gives an annual award, and Dick is going to recognize this year's award recipient. In 2003, the University of Virginia Health System Department of Chaplaincy Services created the Clyde M. Watson, Jr. Distinguished Service Award for Pastoral Care and Education. This uh, award is intended to recognize individuals and groups in the community who have made significant contributions to the chaplaincy department, to patients and families of the health system, and to people in our community. Recipients of this award have included Dr. Nan Brown, Cherry Avenue Christian Church, the priests at St. Thomas Aquinas Roman Catholic Church, Dr. Stan Nolan, retired chief of surgery, the Caring Committee of Congregation Beth Israel, Pastor Joel Jenkins of First Baptist Church, and who is also an officer in the Cha Army Chaplain Corps, and Dr. Marisa Prey, uh, African American Affairs Dean at the University of Virginia. The award for 2010 is being presented to Swami Sarvananda, Supervisor of Chaplaincy Services for Hospice of the Piedmont. Congratulations. Our program today brings to Charlottesville the author of a remarkable book, Here If You Need Me, about the work of a chaplain. The Reverend Kate Braystrup is chaplain to the Warden Service of the State of Maine. Now you may be wondering what prompted our inviting her to speak at Medical Center Hour. What exactly does accompanying game wardens on treks into the North Woods, or out onto the ice of frozen lakes, or scrambling along riverbanks or rocky outcrops in search of missing persons. What does this have to do with the work of physicians and other clinicians in a busy academic health center? But reading Kate Braystrup's memoir, which chaplain residents at UVA do as a part of their training, is a powerful and provocative experience. Indeed, as she describes her work, it becomes clear that the chaplain whether in the Maine wilderness, or in the wilds of the MICU, or the emergency department, is a vital human presence at times of suffering or death, the provider of compassionate care for the anxious and the grieving, be they families or the healthcare providers themselves, or the law enforcement officers with whom she works. And these professionals are doing difficult work, which often includes sometimes bearing the worst news when can. <coughs> So in our Medical Center Hour, Kate Braystrup will draw on her work to explore the rich correspondences between the work of law enforcement officers and clinicians. We uh, also welcome Dr. Scott Severud from the uh, press professor in the emergency department here, um, who will offer a very brief response to her comments. So welcome, Kate, and we look forward to your talk. Good afternoon. <laughs> I am Reverend Kate Braystrup and I am the chaplain to the Maine Warden Service. Maine Warden Service, we have patches like that on our shoulders. Um, mine says chaplain above it, which is another way of saying useless. <laughs> um, people ask me all the time what, why the game wardens need a chaplain. Um, I get a lot of, you know, what do you do, bless the moose? <laughs> and I have once blessed the moose. Last rites. Um, the game wardens in Maine uh, enforce fish and wildlife law, what's called Title 12 in Maine. And that is um, how many fish can you take, how many deer can you hunt, um, how many moose can you kill when the bear season starts, da da da. 
Um, that's important work, especially in a state that's as dependent on its natural resources as Maine is. It isn't work I get involved in very often because um, it does not involve the potential for emotional trauma, except to the moose um, and the bear and the fish. Um, but they also are responsible for uh, conducting a variety, to, for responding to a variety of outdoor calamities. So um, that's snowmobile accidents, it's ATV accidents, uh, freshwater drownings, freshwater boating accidents. We don't do salt water. Um, in Maine, as in other places, all water leads to the sea, however, so sometimes the water's brackish, and there are jurisdictional issues which have to be resolved. Um, not by tasting the water, which is what I thought. It, it's uh, <laughs> a lat long thing. Um, we also do uh, search and rescue operations. So if an Alzheimer's patient wanders off into the woods, if your child wanders off into the woods and you can't find them, um, we have the team that knows how to conduct the search. Uh, because Maine has a, a lot of wild land, to um, lightly settle, uh, and even in our urban areas, we have a lot of, of woods. Um, most of our homicides and suicides also have a wildland dimension. Uh, the, either the bodies in the woods, the suicide occurred in the woods, or there's evidence in the woods. And uh, the warden service responds to those because our investigators and our wardens are accustomed to that environment and know how to interpret that environment. So they actually do a lot of evidence collection and evidence interpretation. Uh, because they can tell things like, um, don't ask me how, but anyway, when, they're, uh, when they interpret a trail that goes into the woods to a grave, oh, I can do this, can't I? And I can move around. Um, they can tell whether the, the person was carrying the body this way or this way. Uh, you know, how long it's been since they passed, what kind of animals have, you know, what is the result of the injuries caused by the perpetrator and what is animal predation, all of that stuff. Now if I turn myself off. No? Okay, good. Um, so, uh, oh, and we also respond to airplane crashes, because when an airplane crashes in Maine, the chances are really good they're going to crash in the woods. So um, there's a lot of that kind of stuff that I respond with that. Uh, I only respond, by and large, if the outcome is likely to be bad. So um, game wardens, like other law enforcement officers, share with physicians uh, familiarity with death, um, but it's not all death all the time for them. It is all death all the time for me. I mean, unless somebody's probably going to die or is dead, um, you don't call the chapel. Uh, so because of that, I'm, and because Maine is a big state and I'm the only chaplain for the warden service in Maine, and one of two statewide chaplains, law enforcement chaplains, period, um, I, do, I teach a lot at the academy to um, transfer as many of my skills as I have to the game wardens because they're going to have to do it without me a lot of the time. So that's, uh, I teach death notification, I teach um, stress, you know, job stress management, I provide pastoral care to wardens, um, I run and train the debriefing team, our peer debriefing team, so that after a uh, very, actually we have a list of criteria for when we have mandatory debriefings. Uh, Anybody know why we make them mandatory, incidentally? Anybody know cops? <laughs> it's not mandatory, they don't show up. I don't need help. <laughs> Fine. Um, so uh, we make it mandatory so they can be mad at me if they need to be. But, um, and I'll tell the older guys, when we first started the program, they'd come in and be like, all right. Yes. And they're like, well, you probably don't need it. But you know, if you don't need it, the worst that can happen is you're going to get more love and attention than you actually require. <laughs> <laughs> and they do that. That's all right. <laughs> and we provide food, so it works out. Um, and I also provide invocations and prayers at ceremonial events. So I'm going to actually, um, what I thought I would do is I, I'll, I'm going to run through my slides, and some of them I'm going to have to skip past really fast because they're dead people who didn't agree to be on the web. So. Um, can those be edited out, they actually? Won't, they won't be out. The slides won't be? Oh, good. OK. Great. Perfect. Then we can have dead people as much as we want. Um, I took out the really gross ones, but there are a few dead people, just FYI. Um, and I'll run through them. And some of them are just illustrations of what we do and what my uniform looks like and stuff like that. Um, and then when I'm done, I thought I would talk a little more about how I teach death notification and then have as many questions as we can fit in. OK. So let's see what we got. All right. This is my field uniform. Um, 
yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, in my, as I get further along in my, um, every time I redo this uniform, the word chaplain gets bigger and bigger. Uh, because I get mistaken for a law enforcement officer, and people will ask me when the moose season starts, or um, if I could just arrest that person over there and <laughs> chaplain. Um, but I, this is my this is what's called a they used to call it a BDU um, battle dress uniform, and then that's sort of politically incorrect. And now it's called a, an FDU, a field dress uniform, lots of pockets. Um, so I, this is what I wear in the field. This was actually at my ordination. And this is uh, the color guard who came to my ordination. <laughs> I mean, what a great job, right? I mean, um, that was the colonel then of the warden service. This is my family. Um, actually, it doesn't include my stepchildren, but um, these are my four children. And that guy was uh, my mentor. He's a um, Unitarian Universalist minister. That's me yapping. Um, so this, at this, uh, we have uh, every year in May is Police Week. <coughs> Everybody who knew that. Um, around the 16th of May, you have Police Week. So if law enforcement officers in your communities are, um, you know, tying blue ribbons on their antennae or something like that, that's what that's about. It's when you, every week, every year, we memorialize <coughs> the fallen officers. Um, in this country, we lose roughly uh, 150 to 200 police officers a year. Sometimes it goes way up, 9-11. Sometimes it goes down. Um, uh, the state of Maryland, for example, loses an average of four a year. Uh, incidentally, uh, Holland is roughly the size of Maryland and roughly the same po population of Maryland, and they've never had a line of duty death. Um, this is the colonel. Uh, this flag actually flew. This was actually the flag that was covering my husband's coffin. My first husband, Drew, was a state trooper. He was killed in the line of duty. Um, we took that flag after 9-11, and my son, Zach, um, insisted we send it down to the landfill to fly over the detectives who had to do the evidence search. Um, so that flag had flown there, and then they had sent it back. So it was only flew again over um, police during police week. Uh, this is at a promotional ceremony. I'm really the comic relief. I think they should spell it C-H-A-P-L-I-N. And I could wear the little hat. Yeah. And this is where I work. Um, loose, yeah. Um, this is at a search. So what, what happens during search and rescues operations is um, we either bring the command post or if we can, we set up a command post in an area that has um, you know, that has access to like a bathroom and water and electricity and all that stuff. So this would probably, was probably in a, I think it was in a fire station. The guys with the laptops are running the search and this is our head of the canine department, uh, a canine squad who uh, was running the, canine, the dogs, dog searches. Um, and this is the person we were searching for. Um, and the reason I have this in here, he died of hypothermia. Um, and you can't see it in the picture, but his uh, shoes were off. His shoes and socks were off. People who have hypothermia in the woods almost always take their, start taking their clothes off because they feel hot. Um, he was out looking for mushrooms and got lost. Uh, and this one I actually liked because we were way out in this really scrubby, crappy woods. Um, it was one of the first times that I said we're going to pray. And all the game wardens took their hats off and did this. I just thought that was so sweet. Yeah. I mean, I didn't say they had to. They um, this is a search up at Baxter State Park um, where they found a guy, they found actually a jawbone, a human jawbone. And so we were conducting a search, um, and I couldn't help but think of it as a jawbone of an ass because he was a drug dealer. But um, <laughs> that's a biblical reference, but I didn't know. Um, <laughs> um, So we do cooperate with other departments, which is what this really shows. The woman in the court, she's a park ranger. The guys in blue are evidence techs from the state police. And then all the guys in green are um, game wardens. This guy down here is Phil, uh, the large man in the corner. He's our Salvation Army guy. He runs the Salvation Army soup kitchen. We love Phil. <laughs> Phil shows up in the most godforsaken places and he brings his you know his donuts and his dinty more beef stew and his Gatorade and we love Phil. <laughs> Amazing ministry that guy had. Um, this is a this was a search for a guy. He actually had a heart attack. He didn't drown, but he was found in water. Let me skip past. Um, this is I'm gonna go faster through these. This is obviously this is actually what happens to a canoe when it gets caught in big waves on a lake. 
You don't think of lakes having big enough waves to do that, but they, they definitely do. This is our dive boat, so this is during an um, underwater recovery operation. And those can go on for a long time because you're doing a grid search underwater, which sounds hard enough to me anyway, because for one thing it's cold, but um, the bottoms of lakes are lumpy, right? I mean, there's big rocks down there. The bottoms of rivers are worse because people chuck all kinds of stuff in the rivers. So there'll be, you know, discarded washing machines. There'll be lots of grocery carts. There'll be monofilament lined with fish hooks that you can't see until they've gotten hooked up in your mask. So the divers, oops, skip by the dead guy. Um, so here's me, this is my job on the dive boat, is to, I'm ballast, basically. Um, <laughs> um, I, we, I, you know, I sit out there and keep them company. They like having me out there, I don't know why the guys do accept that we have a good time, but um, uh, the families often want me to be present when the bodies were covered, especially if they can't be. Uh, we actually try very hard to make it possible for them to have as much connection and input and power and control over what's going on as possible. But they don't really want to be out on the dive boat all day. The guy in the back, Jeremy, is um, running the comm gear. Uh, used to, they used to communicate, when I first came on, the communication was done with tugs on a rope. Um, now we have communication gear, which is a huge improvement, although it freezes up sometimes. Um, so when the comm gear starts working, then I guess my, I'm there to fret. This is dive guys. You can see, actually, how cold it is by the other um, and I guess the ice on the rock we're trying to tell you too. Uh, <laughs> this is the dive team. If I'm ever on Oprah, I'm bringing the whole dive team with me. <laughs> right? I mean, I figure, first of all, you're on Oprah. Who watches Oprah but middle aged women, right? <laughs> so I'll bring all this eye candy and then no one will look at me at all. <laughs> um, snowmobile accidents are a big part of winter. We just came off of snowmobile accident season. Um, people get bashed up. Um, and of course, it's cold. And I think my snowmobile accident things got mixed up, so we'll have more of those. But anyway, canine operations. We don't actually have, we used to have some dogs that were trained as protection dogs, which is attack dogs. Um, we don't anymore because we have to do so much search and rescue that it's just, it confuses <coughs> the dogs about what it is they're trying to do. Uh, fortunately, when we're searching in the woods for, let's say, a um, perpetrator who's taken off and either got lost or doesn't want to be found, um, the, they don't know that. So when they hear the dogs barking, they assume that it's a, an attack trained dog, and, which is very useful because they tend to come out. Uh, dogs, you know, dogs will go right in after someone. They don't stop and question their career choice or <laughs> at that moment. Um, but actually, these are all very gentle, goofy, nice dogs. Uh, Where's Tundra? She's one of our new dogs. I love Tundra. She has a really big spot. <laughs> uh, this is when we sent our, um, some of our canine teams down to uh, New Orleans mm -hmm. after Katrina. Um, these are cadaver dogs. And uh, I actually ended up doing a lot of work. I was supposed to go to New Orleans, but I ended up not going. But when our guys came back, they had found that really a devastating experience. That was really hard. Um, this was, um, this actually, most of our debriefings obviously take place after deaths. Um, multiple deaths, unusually gross deaths, whatever. This was actually one of the ones we did a debriefing on because there were two little girls. One was three and one was about 18 months. And their parents were um, drug dealers and drug users. And one day um, they had decided, and I don't, I know there was an investigation, but anyway, they had decided that the police were going to come over and get them. So they, um, and they rushed out to the True Value hardware store and bought a whole bunch of Krylon paint and they spray painted their car to disguise it. Um, threw their girl, the girls in the back seat in their pajamas and took off into the woods, um, down these woods road. Predictably, the car gets stopped. So they decided that would be a good moment to start freebasing. Um, and then the story got really hazy after that. And uh, the man, actually, the father, came out of the woods appeared at a gas station and explained that his family was still in the woods as far as he knew. So there was a hasty search, what's called a hasty search, done that night, uh, which just means they put dogs, dog teams in the area and try um, around the car. They found the car first. Um, didn't find anything. Uh, the next morning we were geared up for a, a, the big search. And um, when there are children involved, there's usually uh, lots of volunteers to coordinate, lots of 
um, people fills there with the Salvation Army try the whole thing. And um, the call comes over the radio. Um, we found the mother. And everybody's excited, like, great, we found, you know, she's alive. She just walked out of the woods. She doesn't have the kids. And she doesn't know, she hadn't seen them since the night before. So that meant that these two little doodlebots had been in the woods all night and it had been below freezing all night. It had been like 29, 30 degrees. And they were in their pajamas. So we thought at that point, they're gone. Um, so for about, it was only about an hour and a half, uh, we had the planes flying and Charlie later, the pilot, was flying over one area and he looked down and he saw a little blob of pink. And he went, oh, there they are. And he calls and I got them. And then he says, he, look, he was still looking down through the trees and he sees this little face come up. <laughs> and I just remember his voice going off the register like, <laughs> Uh, so they all go tearing and they find him and bring him out. And they had frostbite on their fingers and their nose. And um, they survived, actually, because they were on a, a rock wall. And they figured the stones had held enough heat. And the three-year-old had actually was actually covering her sister all night. Um, it really upset these guys. These were all guys, Kevin especially, the one standing behind. Um, you know, he has a child this age. So for him, this was a big deal. He didn't want to let her go. You know, the paramedics were like, okay. Um, this little girl just wandered off from her family. Um, she spent the night in the woods too, but it was warm, it was winter. Um, but she's only, she's only about two. She's still in diapers. Um, and she was pretty scratched up. But this is actually a good outcome. This is great. Everybody's happy. She's not too happy, but she's gonna, <laughs> things are good. Uh, this is a graduation from the academy. So all these guys have just become new baby game wardens. Um, <laughs> This is, <laughs> um, so I'm giving a, some kind of prayer or something, and the deputy commissioner is standing behind me. And, um, he's actually, all he's doing is, uh, you know, um, shielding me from the wind. It was a very windy day. But, <laughs> <laughs> but because he's kind of an odd duck, they, yeah. <laughs> um, Okay, so now we're back out on the ice. This is also, this frequently happens with snowmobiles, um, which is that, um, do you have snowmobiles around here? Probably not a lot. Yeah, not enough ice. Um, we have lakes that freeze over. In fact, we have lakes in northern Maine that freeze over so solidly that logging trucks, it becomes part of the logging truck road. Um, so we're talking a lot of ice. But ice is water, and it's unstable, and you get holes in it. So even on a day like this, which it was, it was down around 1 or 2 below 0 that day, there's still going to be open water where the um, you get pressure ridges that open out. You get springs and things like that. And um, snowmobile drivers, snowmobile riders, ride out across the ice, which is a blast. And a snowmobile will go easily 90, 100 miles an hour, no problem. And it's all wide open, right? So you can see the attraction. If you're young men, you can see the attraction. So, um, and then they see water. And believe it or not, the normal, sensible thing to do when you see water and you're heading towards it at 100 miles an hour is you put the brakes on and try to turn. And that's where they end up. We always see the, the skid marks are always doing this. Um, they end up in the water and, and, they, and they don't survive. Um, the thing you're supposed to do is gun it. Keep the track straight and go as fast as you can. We had a guy on Sebago Lake. There were three snowmobilers together. Three, two of them knew what they were doing, and the third was a um, was new at it. And they all hit open water. Um, the amateur died. The other two went across open water and survived. One went about 60 yards. The other went a mile and a half over open water before he was back on land wow. in the moonlight. Wow. <laughs> so they, when the divers will, can deploy right off the ice. This is so counterintuitive. It seems like the ice should break, but um, they can go right off it. It's very cold. Um, this drives me crazy because I always want to warm them up. I have this fantasy of bringing a cart around that has like a hot tub on it. <laughs> and I just take them out of the ice and pop them right in the jacuzzi and warm them up. Um, no, yeah, they're mixed up. Anyway, this is a snowmobile accident, obviously. Um, they disintegrate. Snow, the snowmobile disintegrates. People's brains disintegrate. Um, even a helmet won't do much for you if you hit a tree at you know, 70 or 80, which happens all the time. Um, I am very impressed with neurology and neurosurgery, I have to say. I mean, even in the last 10 years that I've been on, um, you know, you've taken fatals and turned them into walking, talking, 
um, hopefully wiser human beings. So um, that's just an amazing thing. Um, this is actually the, we get these helicopters from the National Guard sometimes to come and do extractions for us. That's what they call them. Um, where they, uh, we have a, either a living person or a body who needs to be taken out of really deep woods. Uh, and sometimes it's not possible, especially lately because of the um, Homeland Security doesn't like us using them for this purpose. But um, now the National Guard will sometimes send their Black Hawks over and send a guy down on the spider line and pack up the, the victim and take him out for us. Um, in this case, it was an all-terrain vehicle accident. Um, multiple horrible traumatic injuries. And of course, you're very far away from everything because you've taken the snowmobile or the ATV way out into the woods. So um, in this case, the first part of that trip had to be made on the back of a, um, a, a ATV. One of the things I like about this picture um, is that it shows, you get a sense of how many volunteers and wardens are involved in these things. The warden service actually isn't big enough to do all the searches that we have to do by ourselves. So we count on civilian volunteers, and there are teams of them that actually train and do professional, uh, semi, really, almost professional search and rescue for us, and they're just volunteer teams. But you also get sort of everybody in the community shows up. So you get, you know, these, um, you get these nice old plump church ladies come in and make food and make coffee, and you get the, the old duffers who know where everything is and all the old trails, and they take us out. You get the equestrians come on their horses because then they're great for uh, searching railroad beds. Um, everybody shows up. The soccer team shows up. The Marine Corps guys who are waiting to go to Iraq come over from the airport. They show up. And it's wonderful. I mean, it's really, it's an amazing thing. Um, this is actually a winter operation in an airboat. Uh, this was, uh, we were looking for a guy who probably went into the water on the snowmobile, but we didn't actually have a PLS at point last seen. Um, so it ended up being a very long, very cold, fruitless operation, um, but beautiful. So, oh, there we go. Um, this actually is a hovercraft, um, which it actually knocked the major down in the next minute. Um, it kicks off so much stuff. We, it, a, we're getting a lot of vehicles now that can do multi uh, different kinds of surfaces. They can go from water to um, ice to the parking lot to um, it's kind of an incredible thing. Uh, this one, unfortunately, doesn't provide a particularly stable platform for divers yet. So this um, is, was when it was two or three below zero. They did find the guy, which was good. This was also a day when the wind was blowing so hard that if I did this, I would get blown. Um, that, the guy standing there, the warden standing there, is also a paramedic. So. Um, all of the game wardens, this is a thing about game wardens, they all know how to do multiple things. So, um, you know, one of the guys on the dive team who's um, literally uh, constructed his own snowmobile. You know, he just got a bunch of parts and put together his own snowmobile for the state. I mean, that's normal. They don't think anything of that. I find it incredible because I can't, I can't put together anything. I can't get the lid off an aspirin bottle. Um, this is our plane. Uh, we have four planes, four pilots. Um, we don't have helicopters anymore because they're dangerous, basically. Uh, in, in the conditions we're in, the helicopter's almost always too dangerous. He's got the pontoons on now, so he can land on the lake, um, including the lake near my house. So if I have to be in, if they want me up in Aroostook County, for example, they can send the float plane to get me, pick me up at the dock near my house, fly me up to Aroostook County. I can do whatever it is they want me to do up there. The only hard part about that is they often can't fly me back because conditions will have changed or it's night and it's not good to land on a lake at night and that kind of thing. So um, I end up getting trooper mail back, which is like past like a baton relay, you know. Um, so um, it, it can be a little tricky from my point of view, uh, but it does at least mean that a state that, you know, a seven hour drive can turn into an hour long. Flight. Unfortunately, I get sick in airplanes. Um, I also get sick in, as it turns out, dive boats, ATVs, snowmobiles, <laughs> canoes. Um, they're very forgiving people as long as you puke overboard. Um, so this was a. This was a. Um, we have a lot of recreational boating, obviously in Maine, and among them are we have some pretty incredible rivers and rapids. These guys actually both survived, but there was a drowning on this one, so that which is why I was there. 
again, these guys are fine. They don't need a chaplain. Um, they're praying, I'm sure, just fine by themselves. But uh, downriver from here, there was a, um, the woman who was with them drowned. Um, this is actually the, there was a tremendous flood. Um, this, was, this one happened to be in northern Maine. When we get the spring melt and the snow melts, if it melts all at once, the rivers can't drain it enough. Um, and we've had some really unusually high ones. Uh, this was one that the warden service, well, the warden service responds to these things. Um, and again, one of the great things about game wardens is that they, they really are, they'll, they'll just figure something out. They just would die for it somehow. So they were actually going around to places where the areas where the water was up to the second roof, second um, floor, and they commandeered a front end loader, is that what you call it? The thing with a big bucket? And they were just driving it around town, going up to the windows and taking people out. Put them down, go get another load. I was like, how do you know how to drive a front end loader? Oh, they just, they know. Like the most omnicompetent people. This is at the academy. Um, I'm, I do try to maintain a level of fitness, uh, more or less commensurate with the fact that I'm supposed to be going in the woods with these guys and not being more of a liability than I already am. So um, I do go and participate in the physical assessment test. Um, as it happened, I did 28 push-ups that day. Knees up. Um, I don't think I could do it now. This was a couple years ago. But, um, but I do at least try to maintain enough so that I'm not, um, basically so that I can stay, stay with these guys. I mean, if they, if I don't want to have to abandon them because I'm exhausted in middle age. Um, this is a run. Um, then I got to help with the defensive tactics. Um, and so this is handcuffs, right? I don't handcuff people, except recreationally sometimes. But um, <laughs> so, and the idea behind this, other than just to, because it was sort of fun, was um, that if I participate in this stuff, and this goes for using firearms and all of that stuff, um, that I'll go and I'll use, uh, I'll go and do some firearms training, not because I have any interest in carrying a gun or using a gun or anything, but because they have to do it. And so the more I can know about what they do, the better able I am to serve them. So um, participating in sort of how you do defensive tactics, how you do um, immobilization and um, pain compliance and things like that, uh, the, the, presumably the more I would understand what the guys are talking about without, without having to make them back up. So that's why I had to do the, uh, <laughs> I, I can't remember who was sub subduing whom. <laughs> I like to tell people I won, because he's not here. He can't <laughs> um, this was actually at the inauguration, believe it or not. Um, I got, my cousin took us to the inauguration, so there was this inauguration ball, and I decided the main warden service was gonna be at the ball. Um, so I went in uniform. Everybody else is wearing like tuxedos and ball gowns and stuff, and I'm in my uniform. And um, boy, you get in great conversations with Secret Service agents when you're dressed like that. <laughs> and uh, and no one's afraid of you. I spent like a, a half an hour talking, exchanging birth narratives with the vice president's mom. <laughs> it's like well, that's all right. She's a priest or something. <laughs> um, but Dustin Hoffman was there, and I told everybody that the. Uh, I told, I told the game wardens that I'd have my picture taken with a celebrity, and I was kind of hoping for Obama, but um, <laughs> apparently there were a lot of celebrities there, but I don't recognize any celebrity. He was the only one I recognized, so I think I actually said to him, Mr. Hoffman, you're the only celebrity here I recognize. You won't have I don't even think I said that I love your work, nothing. It's just like, but he was very nice about it. Um, did I think that? Might be it. Yeah. So. Um, so that sort of gives you a little bit of a sense um, of what I work, what I do, and where I do it. Um, ten more, okay. Um, as I said, I work uh, because I'm not always, I'm not contrary to the title of the book. I am not always there when they need me. Um, so I teach staff notification and other things that they can. Um, most of the time, I am doing death notification unless it's in service, <coughs> sort of up, updating. I'm doing it with the new baby wardens, who are primarily young men. So I'll start out generally by saying something like, okay, you guys, um, how many of you think that someday you might die? Not a hand goes up. <laughs> Not one. There's this like, 
And then they sort of think about it, and they're like, oh yeah, right, okay. So then they put their hands up, like, great, okay. Um, and how many of you think it's possible that you might lose someone you love to death? And now they're on to me, so they're all like, okay, yeah. And I said, and I tell them, there's bad news about that, which is obvious, right? Death is crummy, it takes people away from us that we love, um, it makes us incredibly sad. That there is good news about that, too. And the good news is that because death is not a possibility, it is not even a probability, it is a certainty. Because of that, and be, that that's true now, and it has always been true all the way back to the first slime mold that hauled itself out, or all the way back to the fall, whichever, um, you, um, because of that, we can know with absolute certainty that this is something we know how to do. So when they go to give death notification, what they fear about death notification, cops hate death notification. How many of you who are you know, physicians and nurses and stuff love death notification? Right? Um, cops don't like it. Cops do it, although they don't always do it. They do in Maine. In Maine, we have our SOP is two officers go to a house, um, give notification, and stay until the person seems to have whatever resources they need to go, kind of go on from there, or until the person kicks them out, whichever comes first. Um, in, play, in some places, for instance, in San Francisco, I did a ride along with the San Francisco PD, um, they don't have police go do death notification. So I said, well, how do you do it? They said, well, the family gets a call from the coroner saying, um, we have a body that needs to be identified. Um, to their credit, when I explained how we do it in Maine, they said we'd rather do it that way. I wish we did it that way. Um, when you give death notification, all you're really doing is you're transferring a piece of information that belongs to that family from yourself to them. And it's one sentence, really. Uh, in your case, in terms, of, in terms of physicians, of course, you don't only do death notification, you also do cancer notification and amputation notification and all kinds of other variations on the theme. I think the same thing would apply which is uh, the information has to be given clearly and it has to be given unequivocally. Um, you can't mess around with a lot of uh, euphemisms because they will not be heard. And the way that I describe that to them is I use my own story, which was when my husband died, I was given death notification. And I said, if the guy who notified me, the chief of the Thomaston Police Department, hadn't been my own department chief, hadn't been in my town so that I could go tell him afterwards, I am absolutely sure that he would think he was a horrible part of a horrible memory. I'm sure of that. Um, I don't remember what I did or said. For all I know, I was hitting him. I mean, I really don't know. But what I, what I remember and what I was able to tell him was that his face to this day was the first loving thing I saw in this new life that I didn't want, but that I was entering into. Um, one of the game wardens that I love, an old guy, described it as standing, you're standing on the hinge of someone's life. Right? And the old life, the life with your husband, or the life with your mom, or your leg, or your breast, or whatever it is, that life ends, and this new life without your mom, or your leg, or your breast starts, and you're right on that hinge. And that's a hard place to be. It's a fearsome place to be. Um, but it is also an extraordinarily privileged place to be. So when I talk to the game wardens about it, what I tell them is there are some things that they can expect from the family member. Um, these are good things. These are actually manifestations of love. When the person goes down, which is usually what happens, their knees get out from under them and go down, that's fine. Um, in fact, I actually tell them, don't worry about finding a sofa or a chair or anything. The floor is good because you can't fall off. The floor is excellent, go down, they go down to the floor. One of the reasons I don't wear a bulletproof vest all the time is because I have to be able to go down to the floor too. Um, but all you have to do is wait. Give them about 20 minutes and they will ask you a very sensible question, which is nearly always, where is he? Where's the body? When can I see the body? Um, we know how to do this. They don't have to make it up, it's in them. And all you have to do is be with them and affirm it. Um, there's a lot of detail about that, but I'll leave that for questions. Um, but I did want to say, the one death, there was one death notification, it was one of the early ones that I did, that was, um, well, we show up at the house, the game warden and I, and um, 
I'm pretending to know a lot more about this than I actually did because he was young and I was middle-aged and I'm supposed to be a minister. So knock on the door and go in and it's the brother was there and I think the wife was there and a couple of other people. And make sure you're in the right house, you have the right people, blah, blah. And we said, well, you know, um, yeah, <laughs> that's important. Um, and we said, well, you know, uh, we found your brother. He's, um, he was in a snowmobile accident and he's dead. And, you know, we're both sort of, and uh, nothing. They kind of look at us and then the brother says, well, he was an asshole. <laughs> when can we have a snowmobile? <laughs> And uh, the local police actually confirmed this guy was. <laughs> and actually, if I had it to do over again, um, and what I, you know, the reason I bring it up is that's what happens when no one loves you. When, for one reason or another, you have burned out the people who were supposed to love you by beating them up and various other things that this guy did. Um, and actually, I can't imagine a, a better definition of hell than you die and nobody's sad. Um, but in retrospect, I would have spent more time with that family because he did have a history of domestic abuse. The wife was there. And that could have been much more complicated than it seemed on the outside. That to lose some, you know, that loss might actually have been more complicated even than the ones that look more complicated. They're rolling around on the floor, you know, they're peeing in their pants, they're screaming, they're yelling. That's great. That's awesome because that's luck. Um, another thing I tell the guys is you can't subtract pain. That's not a choice. You cannot subtract pain. You can't subtract death and you can't subtract pain, but you can add love. And people who have just had a significant loss are remarkably open to love. It doesn't even take that much. Um, I had one kid write me a letter, and what he remembered was that I had asked him in the truck on the way to the scene um, whether he was car sick. I turned around and said, honey, are you car sick? And I didn't even think about it. It was like a mom thing. Um, that's what he remembered. That I, um, and that's the privilege, is you get to be the first face of love in this new place. Um, so now let's get on the questions in case there are any. Yes. Oh, Scott has to go first. Okay. So I have to turn myself off. So I promise to be brief because I know what you really want to do is ask questions to Kate. But um, first, uh, a true story. Um, a friend of mine, a nurse, uh, was working in an emergency department in Kentucky. Um, she was doing CPR, doing chest compressions on a, a man who had suffered cardiac arrest. And the physician was having a great deal of difficulty securing the airway. Um, couldn't get an endotracheal tube in. So he had him page overhead in the hospital, anesthetist needed to the ER stat. Anesthetist needed to the ER stat. You've heard those pages. A couple minutes later, the doors to the resuscitation area popped open, and a pastor in full clerical garb appeared, uh, out of breath. Um, and he panted, I'm not a Methodist, but can I help? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and he did actually end up helping, <laughs> not with the airway. Obviously. But um, I, I say that in the context that I'm obviously not a chaplain, um, but I'll, I'll try to help on this too. Um, I'm more analogous to the wardens you work with in that I'm a frontline caregiver in an emergency room. And, and like you said, we take care of people in crisis, um, trauma, uh, and sometimes death. And uh, I also am a state employee. I work at the state hospital um, for the Commonwealth of Virginia. And uh, I think no one in this room is going to be surprised when I say our state budget is contracting and that we've all had to look at other services we render. Has to, and, and think about what's essential and what's non essential, what can we cut. And in this context, when I read Kate's book, two passages really spoke to me. Um, uh, they made me reflect on why a hospital chaplain service really is essential. Um, the first one, uh, read it here. Uh, Kate is quoting a police detective uh, who 
in turn is describing the toll the crisis situation takes on his fellow officers. Uh, quoting, incidents can be rated on a scale of one to 10. Sometimes during your career, you might get one or two incidents worth a 10. A murder, maybe a young victim, or the death of a friend or colleague. Those are tens. Most incidents are gonna be way down the scale, uh, maybe like a two or a three. But you know what? I think it's those twos, threes, and fours that add up over time. I think those are the ones that really get you in the end." End quote. Um, we have some tens in the emergency department. Um, I mean, a, a recent child abuse case I was involved in comes to mind. Um, a, a man who came to the emergency department with his wife with what seemed like a routine complaint. Uh, he was joking with us and then uh, suddenly he proceeded to die right in front of her, uh, despite our best efforts. Those are tens. Um, but we have a lots, lots of twos and threes, too. Um, and they do get to us. Um, no matter how professional we are, no matter how balanced we are in our life, they get to us. We wouldn't be human if they didn't. Um, the second passage in her book that meant a lot to me, um, and Again, these are Kate's words, but I've substituted uh, some hospital terms where she used law enforcement terms, so I forgive me for that. Quoting, I am sometimes asked whether my employment as a chaplain violates the separation of church and state. After all, I'm present at times of crisis in the rooms of the suddenly bereaved, not as a social worker or a counselor. It's written there right in my white coat. I'm a chaplain. Um, I'm an obviously religious person using religious forms and language in what would otherwise be a completely secular environment. So why do caregivers and hospitals need a chaplain? The simple answer is they don't need me. I'm not necessary in any urgent, practical sense. They could manage should my position be abolished. I don't make the difference between order and chaos, between life and death. They do. But I'm told that it's helpful to have a chaplain present at the bedside in the time of crisis, that by taking on the task of being with the patient and the family, I free the caregivers up for other tasks. Perhaps more important, as a minister, as opposed to some other brand of caring professional, I serve as a symbol of a profound truth. My uniformed presence signifies a human and a humane understanding on the part of the caregivers and the hospital that the body on the stretcher is not just a clinical event, but a matter of tremendous spiritual significance for those most intimately involved. As a reverend, I can express our reverence. So there it is, a, a succinct description of why chaplains, or what chaplains mean for our patients and their families. And just as importantly, I'll say what they mean for us, the frontline caregivers. Um, she wrote, uh, Here If You Need Me, it's the name of the book. And I'll just say, Chaplains, um, uh, so often we do. Thank you. Both. We have a few minutes for your questions and comments. I will let you know we have to vacate the room promptly at 1.30 because of a video telecast that's going to be happening in here. So there will be time for some additional comments and questions uh, outside the door at the top of the auditorium uh, where the UVA bookstore has uh, Kate Braystrup's books for sale and for signing. And you're welcome to come up there with additional questions. But we can take some uh, questions and comments right now. So please identify yourself when you ask the question. Yes, I'm Reverend Morris Hutchins at the Thomas Jefferson Memorial Church, the Rugby Road. Uh, I was thinking in your book, about, uh, I was impressed by the way that you dealt with the death of your husband by wanting to spend the night with him after he died. Uh, Not in the coffin. Not in the coffin. <laughs> Next time. Next to it. <laughs> and I guess my question is, how do you recommend, in a culture where we push the body away and we don't, we don't deal with it, what are ways that you would recommend for people who have experienced the death of a loved one to do other things other than spend the night with them? Yeah. Um, 
So I just. I didn't actually get to spend the night, um, but I wanted to. Um, no, the thing that I had to push. Oops, sorry. Did I do it? Okay. Um, the thing that I actually had to push for was just to get to see and touch his body before the. Um, I mean, I wanted to go to the accident scene, but that wasn't um, a possibility. It could have been, but it wasn't. Um, what I wanted to do was to take care of his body. And that, I think, um, I had been a little bit prepared for. Oh, that's right. If I do what? Well, I'll just do this. This is fine. I don't mind this. Um, if I. Um, I had been a little bit prepared for because I read a book called From Death to Dust, Everything You Wanted to Know About What Happens to the Body After It Dies, which Drew had given me as a birthday present um, <laughs> after he heard the guy interviewed on NPR while I was driving around in his cruiser, and he thought, ooh, Kane would love that book, which he did, so it was, I did, and it was very romantic. But um, uh, So I actually had sort of thought through this stuff, and we had talked about this stuff, so I already knew I wanted to take care of his body, which I wouldn't have otherwise. And, um, and that can actually be very hard for people, is that because most of us are amateurs, thank God, when it comes to these things, we don't necessarily have a fully formed thought. Uh, I want to do this. I want to see him. I want to, and so we're very, very vulnerable to professional people who are saying, and then we're going to do this, and we're going to whisk him away here, and it's not good for you to do this, and whatever. Um, not to diss funeral directors too much, but they are really um, can be quite aggressive about that. So um, I, in the ward service, we have been developing, um, and really have developed in a way, a very proactive stance when it comes to this. So when we're waiting for a recovery, let's say, and I'm with a family, I will say, when the body is recovered, when would you like to see the body? Um, you can see him as soon as you want. Uh, the deal I make with them is that I see the body first, they actually have the right to see it whenever they want. I mean, it's theirs. It's their possession. Um, but um, I say, you know, I would like to see the body myself first and come to you because that way I can prepare you. Um, because just things like um, most people, when they've seen dead bodies, they've been in uh, a hospital or they've been in a funeral home or something, and the arms are down by their sides. Uh, in a drowning, um, the body characteristically does this. Yeah. Um, well, not if it's it, not if it's bloated. If it's bloated, that's another thing. But if um, but because we just the physics of the thing, your arms tend to be up like this, um, and then rigor mortis freezes them there, right? So the person, all right, that's not a big deal. It's nothing horrible has happened. There'll be lividity usually in the face. Um, nothing bad is about. There's nothing bad about that, but it's unfamiliar. So I'll say his arms will be up like this. It'll be his face will look red and bruised. That doesn't mean he was bashed up, it just means that's where the blood settled. I'm very, very precise about it. I don't think I'm, I try not to be gross about it, but I try to be precise. There will be, you know, there was damage from the propeller here. There was, you know, um, so that they can make the decisions that they want to make. The body will be covered, you can unzip the body bag, you can take off the blanket, you can do as much of that as you want, this is yours, I'll stay with you, um, and you, you have control over this process. I have never been turned down. If it was possible to see the body, I have never been turned down, which is really surprising to a lot of people. I talk to a lot of groups of cops and whoever, and that really surprises them. And that the times when you would think they wouldn't want to see the body, they still do. Um, it's usually a big disappointment to them if they can't. If it's a homicide scene or a suicide scene, um, the body's evidence. So you can't, you know, the whole field is an evidence. You can't contaminate the, the scene. Um, and in those cases, I will say, is there something I can bring to the scene for you? Can I bring um, prayers? Are there things you'd like me to say to the body? Can I, um, sometimes there'll be a talisman, an object, you know, a cross or a, you know, whatever, um, his favorite hat, I mean, whatever it is, that I will bring and put in the body back with him. And that will sometimes be a substitute for them. Um, but that's a big thing. It's a really big thing, and one that the wardens do very well. State police aren't there yet. But, um, and we're talking bodies that have decomposed. We're talking about bloated bodies. With, you know. How's that? Yes, you're back. Okay. Other questions? Okay. 
Hi, my name is Beth, I'm a nurse practitioner um, here at EVA, and I used to work in the medical ICU for years and years, and I just wanted to um, just kind of focus uh, a little um, on the medical students who are here. There's a lot of medical students, I think, in the room. Um, just to remind them that it doesn't always have to be the chaplain that is present and sits. Um, medical students can do a really good job sitting, nurses can be present. I know at the end, um, you know, where, especially in the ICUs, you know, you work so hard to keep this person alive, and then the decision is made to turn off, you know, all the bells and whistles and to just make the patient comfortable, and then it's like everybody disappears, you know, you just had 25 people in the room, and then there's no one, and the, you know, the little wife or the daughter is just sitting there all by herself, but um, just being a presence as a healthcare provider is huge, and Dr. Severed would, um, yeah. Well, and, and actually, that's come up when I've talked to um, physicians groups before. Um, wardens, I, I tell the wardens often, um, by and large, they are a very cozy group of cops. Um, there are some guys who are really good at being with people, at just being with, and there's some that aren't. And I tell them, if you know that you are not, this isn't your thing too antsy, you're too hyperactive, you've got six other people in the ICU that you have to get to, I mean, in medical terms, you know, you've got stuff you have to get to, um, A, that's when you use your chaplain. You really, really need your chaplain. Um, I'm sympathetic to it because I know from working with cops that sometimes there really isn't time and sometimes it is very hard to shift gears from the doing to sitting. Um, I'm good at sitting. I'm a lot, uh, stand around a lot. That's sort of what I practice all the time, so I'm good at it. Uh, they, you shouldn't feel, in other words, don't feel guilty if you find it uncomfortable or it's difficult or if you're the only game in town, then you're it. You know, if you're the only one to do the death notification, you're it. Do the best job you can. Um, but call in the people who are good at it. Um, and I just, I just pitch in there, just a very brief comment. The death notification scene in Little Miss Sunshine, if you've never seen it, oh, nice. it's, it's just classic yeah. because it distinguishes the difference between the performance art of the death yes. notification and just being there. And if you haven't seen that movie or if it's worth seeing again, you might watch that scene. It's pretty funny. Yeah. I'm going to have to call an end to the hour because I'm mindful of the fact we need to go yes. to the other telecast. But, um, please join us for additional questions out in the uh, upstairs lobby and Kay will be there uh, to sign books. Um, next week we have a program called Normal at Any Cost, Tall Girls, Short Boys, and the Medical Manipulation of Height with Susan Cohen and Christine Cosgrove, science journalists. So join us then. Thank you again, Kate. Thank you. Mr. Prince,